Hello there, boys and girls, and all of those in between. My name is Melina Bitchcock, and welcome to Bitch Talk with Bitchcock, my very own talk show where I get to interview some of the best performers from all over. I'm very happy because this week I get to entertain and interview one of my favorite girls from Texas, the one and only Monique LaFay. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, girl. How you doing, girly girl? I'm so good. How are you? Do you know it's a little warm here in Oregon today, but I'm definitely surviving. <laughs> I'm in Texas, baby. It's been 90 since January. Oh my gosh. I don't know how you drag queens out there do it. I would be sweating my ass off. You do. <laughs> <laughs> well, how are you surviving quarantine? Are you guys starting to open up yet? Um, Texas has start slowly started to open up. Uh, we have restaurants and some like retail businesses open. Um, it has been an adjustment. It was very abrupt. I work in food service during the day and then, you know, five nights a week at the bars. So it has been a little bit of a, an abrupt change to life, but we have, my dog is loving it. Um, <laughs> we've spent more time together, my husband and I, than ever. And here we are, we're pushing through. I love that girl. Well, I know we have so much to talk about and all these bitches watching is ready to, for you to spill all the fucking tea. So let's definitely get into the bulk of it, my love. Um, why don't you actually tell me when you first started drag? Um, I started drag too. I was a Halloween baby. Um, I, it was in a, my small town that I grew up in. I grew up in Coos Bay, Oregon. And um, a queen named Morgan Le Fay had um, retired back home to Coos Bay, and I convinced her to put me in drag for this big gay Halloween party that happened every year. And it was like the one gay event in my little teeny town. Um, and it was all kind of over from there. <laughs> the monster was created. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love it. So you're actually technically a Halloween baby. Um, why don't you tell me what you look like that first time in drag? Um, I wore, it was a white nurse's costume with a bouffant hairdo and a full rolled bang and a white uh, headband. It was quintessential, bright red lip and just some lashes. I, I wouldn't be mad at it today, but it wasn't the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, she was a professional Madonna and Dolly Parton impersonator, and she really, okay. like, she did it right. I didn't look awful, but the first time that I did it myself was a travesty. Well, I mean, I think we all start there, but look at you now, Miss Monique. You are this beautiful woman. Oh, thank you, baby. <laughs> Absolutely. So, how did you go from dressing up for a Halloween party to being a performing drag queen at local bars out in Portland. Um, so I, over the course of like from 16 to 18, I would sneak away to Portland and go to the escape or I guess it was Club Z at the time, um, the all ages nightclub that was there forever. And um, I would sneak away and I had this really good friend from high school who was doing drag in Portland and she convinced me to do drag and to continue to like come up and she would put me in drag. She would help me out a lot. Um, her name was Delana Odora and she worked at the Embers. Um, so eventually when I was 18, I moved to Portland and um, I performed a couple of times at the All Ages Club and then Bolivia Carmichael's said, come down on Thursday night and audition. I have a spot available on Thursdays. And I went down that Thursday and auditioned and I got cast for Thursday and Friday nights when she was hosting both Thursday and Fridays at the Embers. And it was kind of all over from there. I became a working queen really fast. Oh my girl, I love it. Um, and you started to work at Embers quite often, didn't you? Yeah, I was at the Embers um, starting out on Thursdays and Fridays. And then I worked my way into Wednesdays, which were a fetish night. Um, and I got to like explore a little bit um, of a crazier, wilder side of me um, and really find kind of that piece of my drag. And then I worked my way onto Patio Dora's Saturday night. Like I was a backup cast member. So I would come in and fill in. Um, it was like an understudy for Saturday nights um, when Patio Dora had the longest running show there. 
Um, and eventually I kind of moved my way up. I co-hosted a bunch of shows. I was there four nights a week for over six years. Did you ever perform out maybe on the Darcell stage out there in Portland? Um, I performed at Darcell's a couple of times. I was never a Darcell's girl, um, but I got the opportunity to be on the stage a few times. Um, I competed for a pageant there. I always did the underage show when I was underage and a bunch of benefit shows and things. I loved that. I loved working at CC Slaughter's with the girls on Sunday night. Um, I kind of worked a little bit of everywhere. Silverado on Sundays every now and then. Um, it was a blast. It was a ton of fun. Now, and you actually started at 18, is that correct? Um, I was 16 when I started like drag and then I started performing at 18, yeah. And I would say it was my full-time job pretty fast once I turned 18, it was crazy. Oh my gosh. And were you working in all the clubs out in Portland at that time or were you just doing the um, all ages club? When I was under 21, I worked at anywhere that would let me perform. Um, which at the time was really like Darcell's for the All Ages show, The Escape, and then the Embers would allow a handful of us at the time, and then it grew to be a lot more um, of us underage kids to come down and we could be on cast. We just couldn't go out in the audience. We couldn't leave the stage. Um, we had to like be backstage or on stage, and that was it. Um, but yeah, I worked in with it with that, truthfully. Oh, goodness. Well, you know, I, I know you've grown such a big name for yourself out in Portland, um, and then you eventually came out here to Eugene. What, but didn't you actually take a break at all? Um, yeah, so I took a couple of like small, I took a hiatus when I was like 20 to 21. I took a hiatus um, in between moving from Portland to Eugene, um, which was like 2010. I took like probably six months off. I feel like you have to like take a little time off every now and then to fully rejuvenate yourself and like come up with new concepts and like I don't think that taking a moment to breathe with your drag is a bad thing um and truthfully the last time that I did it I took three years off um and it was probably the best thing that I could have done for drag like I came back so much more invigorated and ready and um wanting to create this whole new character which is exactly that that time off was all that I really needed to kind of find the fully realized version of myself. I love that and you know it definitely can take a journey from the beginning to actually find who you want to be in drag which actually brings me into my next question is did you always start as Monique or what was the evolution into actually finding your drag character? <laughs> so I had a few my very first drag name was Chi Chi Ariola Oh my goodness. Well, um, it was, I knew a real woman named Chi Chi Ariola. It was, it's a long story short. Um, so that was my very first drag name. And then I was Vegas Strips. Um, a little bit of hooker, a little bit of showgirl. You didn't know what hand you were going to get dealt. Um, and then the Platinum family in Portland um, was passed down to me. And that was probably like 2005. And I became Vegas Platinum. And for the rest of my time in Portland, that was what I was known as. Um, and then for the first few years in Eugene. And then when I came back after the long hiatus is when I changed my name to Monique Le Fay. Um, Le Fay in honor of Morgan Le Fay and the Queen of the Fairies and the first person who put me in drag. And um, Monique because she's a little sassy. I love it. And well, you know, I love that you kind of went through an evolution where you kind of went through several different characters. And I'm kind of curious, is most of those characters, are they similar or was there like definite differences between them all? Um, the next one is always heightened. So Chi Chi Ariola like morphed into Vegas Platinum, who mo morphed into Monique Le Fay. Like, it's like Marilyn Monroe. She went by a lot of different names over her life, but like the one that like got her there was Marilyn Monroe. All right. Now, okay. Monique, I know you started out in Portland and you worked with some amazing entertainers. Did you ever have a drag family out there or any drag mothers that helped you along the way? Um, yes, I had. Well, Morgan helped me as much as she could until she passed away, and she, but she was always kind of at a distance. Um, Crystal Lynn was always my, like, my grandmama. She kind of guided the way for a long time for a lot of us. Um, Delano Odora taught me the way in the beginning. 
as far as like a drag mother, I didn't necessarily like have a drag mother back then. Um, but I was the mother of the House of Platinum. And I had a bunch of children at one time, like we had like 10 of us living in a two bedroom apartment. And it was, you know, it was kind of the Valentines, the cities and the Platinums. And we caused a mess. It was fun. <laughs> we had some really good Oh my goodness, girl, I love that. So why don't you actually tell me what does having a drag family actually mean to you as a performer? Like, do you, does it help you have someone to bounce ideas off of? And is it easier to have someone that truly understands what you're going through? Yeah, I think that at the core of what we do is a drag family. And I think that that is, um, a big thing and it, especially when I was coming up there wasn't Facebook there wasn't anybody to like look up to there wasn't anybody to show you the way if you will and not with just drag but with like gay life like there wasn't anybody out and open you know there was will and grace I guess maybe when I was young like that was it and so finding a family and a drag family you know there was many people in my drag family who weren't performers but they were part of the family you know we were all a core group and we stuck up for each other and we taught each other life lessons and you know if one of us was eating we were all eating it we really were a family um and then beyond that they we pushed each other to create new things and to do these amazing performances and to create art together and i think that that at its core is amazing I love that girl and you you're lucky enough to have a drag mother because again I came from a small town and I like to consider myself a drag orphan where again I had to learn everything off of trial and error so yeah. I really do love that you had someone to learn off of now because you have the opportunity I know that you've also wanted to pass on your knowledge do you have any drag children um so the platinums I had a bunch and there's still a couple of them that are super active uh, Timmy Levicious in Portland. Um, he was just a prince in Portland. He's one of my original drag children. I love him to death. Um, but in Eugene, I decided that under the House of LaFay, there needed to be some children. So I have Doc Ranger. Um, he's the hottest boy in town. He's amazing. Um, yes. I, love um, I have Uranus the Fool, who's just crazy. And she's like the skinny little supermodel version of me. Um, when I was still super punk rock and like, I just love her to death. And then I have my bubblegum princess, Bonnie Rose. Um, those kids give me my entire life. Um, we really create and um, they're some of the only people that I still talk to on a daily basis from back home. Them and their auntie caress, like we created this little family unit that was like no other. Um, they inspired me a lot. I love that. And, you know, I love that you took a younger generation and kind of passed on some of your knowledge. And I get to work with them, some of your drag children quite regularly. And I really love working with Bonnie, for one. She's such a fucking personality that it's just never a dull moment with her. And Uranus, I mean, I co-host the Phenomenon show with her, so she's my co mc And I, I never know what that bitch is going to say on the microphone. <laughs> Let's be real. <laughs> and she's so fucking pretty. I'm just like, girl, this should be illegal for you to look like this. It's true. It's true. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So tell me a little bit about the character that you created that now is Monique LaFay. Um, I don't know. I feel like she is this kind of ultra glamazon plus size model um, she might live in Atlanta, like, she definitely hangs out with NeNe Leakes. Um, she's the heightened version of who I really am. Um, she is who has always allowed me to kind of live out my fantasy of who I am at, like, a heightened level. Um, I, I owe her all of me finding myself. She is the epitome of a woman in my mind. Okay, I love that. Now, would you say that when you found Monique, that that helped bring confidence into your life? For sure. Um, drag has always been kind of my 
mask um, at the end of the day where I was able to come out and really be myself. Um, my trans identity for a long time was kind of up in the air and for a really long time I was totally okay with you know waking up as a boy in the morning and because I got to do drag that day. Um, but Monique has really kind of forced me to find who is really inside of me um, and to give her a voice. Um, I wouldn't be embarking on this new journey of transness without Monique. I love that. Now, there is a personality switch, I'm guessing. Even with you going through this transformation within your life, I'm guessing there's still a switch in personality once you become Monique. Um, tell me about the personality that is Monique Le Fay once you put the wig and makeup on and how that compares to you from real life. Um, I feel like in real life, I'm a little bit more low key. I, you know, I love makeup and I love fashion, but I'm a little bit more like hippie girl, um, really down to earth and just chill. Like I'm not the like loudest one at the party or anything like that. When I'm in drag and like when I am in the full zhuzh, I feel like she becomes the it girl. Like. I, and it is a, a version of me that the anxiety is taken away and I can go out and just live uninhibited, um, which, you know, as a gay man or as a trans woman, it is hard to walk down the street during the day. So this is what gives me power. And she becomes the, the it girl because of it. I love that. And I think drag has been always a way for the queer community to kind of take the power back from all the oppression that we've gone through through the years. And, you know, it's kind of that armor and that inner, I don't know, the inner spinach that we eat to become the superheroes that we are. Sorry for the Popeye reference. I'm old. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I love that, Monique, because you are definitely a confident queen. And I've noticed that mostly from when you're on stage. So why don't you tell me a little bit what we are to expect from a Monique Le Fay performance? Oh gosh. Um, you can expect either a story through, a, I love a ballad. Um, you can expect me to maybe stand in one spot and give you emotion and every word of a song. I will give you every breath. It will come from my soul. You will think that I am performing it. Um, you can expect that, or you can expect, you know, a semi-high energy, um, kind of grooving. I love some R&B. You can expect a costume and hair and makeup and a full look. Um, that's really what I love about what we do. I love that. Now, are you known for ever doing any major dance moves or tricks on stage? <laughs> I can like maybe give you a high kick every now and then. Um, when I was a children, when I was a child back in the day, I I would split and kick and do all these things. But anymore, like you get a little one, two step, kick, 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 and that's all you get. I, I'm real good at being a swaying mountain. <laughs> oh boy, but girl, I mean, years ago, I kind of vaguely remember you doing a pride performance with a whole fucking dance troupe, didn't you? Well, yeah. <laughs> um, they did most of the dancing, though. Let's be honest. Like, I just gave them a little one to Vogue. See, I can't even Vogue right now. <laughs> I love it, though. So what do you think actually separates you from other queens from on the stage? Oh, gosh. Um, that's a hard question, because... I am very critical of myself. I think that a lot of us are. Um, what separates me is, I feel like often there's a missed moment in the emotion and the soul behind the song. And I can't do a song unless it like comes from me. Um, it has to be something that like I feel deep in my soul. Um, so I feel like that spirit and that energy um, that comes from that is maybe what sets me apart. I think that back home, like, I mean, my costumes and my hair and things like that. But in Texas, I'm a small fish in a big pond. There are so many 
amazing queens and I've really had to push myself here. Okay, I get that for sure. So Monique, I know you consider, you call yourself kind of a queen of a certain age, which I find kind of funny because I just found out yesterday that I'm older than you. Um, so I'm like, really now, bitch. But <laughs> with that said, what kind of music do you tend to perform to? I feel like I've seen you perform a lot of 90s music. Oh my god, 90s is my favorite. I'm like seriously wearing 90s print. Like, it's if I could just be a 90s kid for the rest of my life, it's all that I really want. Um, yeah. So, I have a solid 90s song. <laughs> um, I love 80s, 70s, and 80s RB. Um, those are like where my heart is, and that's usually like what I um, relate to most. So, I mean, Tony Braxton is my very favorite artist on earth. I give me some good old Gwen Guthrie and Stephanie Mills and Anita Baker and I'll be happy. Um, I'm kind of all over the place. Like that is really where my performance and my world sticks to, but I'm not afraid. I love some top 40. I'll go out and do some hip hop every now and then. I love some La Kele. Um, so it's all over the place. I just like to make sure that the crowd is enjoying themselves and that it's a song that, like, I absolutely love. I love that. Now, do you ever make any mixes or perform to any, like, special drag mixes? As us queens, we like to mix stuff and put our own personality in there. I mean, I'm sure you being a queen of so many talents, you do. So tell me, girl. <laughs> um, I mix. Oh, I can make a mix or two. <laughs> um... I, you know, I love to make like a 90s or like an 80s medley. I love to do medleys of entertainers. Um, I don't make that much of my own mixes, but I can. Um, I like to purchase from people who are really good at it. They're not that expensive and um, they'll make them custom, you know? So um, I just got a really good JoJo mix that is off the charts. I got a new 90s mix that's off the charts, but I didn't make them. Oh my god, Jojo. If I remember, didn't she like sing, Get out right now. It's that's the end of you and me. That's the one. <laughs> that's the only song I can remember she did. She just came out with a new album and it's really good. Ooh, I l used to love her, so I might have to actually check that out. Really, so, really yeah. So, Monique, you, like you said, you're able to get some mixes made, and I know you're a funny bitch. Do you actually ever bring comedy to your performances? Um, every now and then. I love, um, is it Wendy Ho? Like, I love a, a remake of a song that is, like, the words are flipped around. Um, I have a really good Tourette's mix um, that I haven't done in a very long time. Um, so yeah, every now and then I'll do a little comedy. You know, I love some drama as comedy. Like I love to do designing women uh, skits. Yes. I think that, that like is comedic in, a, in and of itself. Um, you know, I, yeah, I like to do a little bit of comedy. I, I love a ballad that tells a funny story. I love it. You know, you mentioned even you, the almighty Monique Le Fay, who it just literally is this beautiful goddess. Even you sometimes doubt yourself. So, I mean, even though you seem so confident, do you ever kind of, tell me about what kind of goes through your mind when you're doing a performance? I think the nerves are, I'm like of the faith that uh, nerves are a really good thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think this for sure, especially at new clubs. Moving here was like a whole, you know, coming from a place that I worked and performed at for oh gosh, 17 years I was doing drag in, in Oregon. And coming from that to a place where they didn't know me, um, gosh, I'm nervous every time I walk out on stage. It's always that build up and that, are they gonna like me? And, you know, I think that nerves are a good thing. I think that um, you should want the audience to appreciate what you're doing, you know? Right. <laughs> And it's true, you know, you want your art to be kind of translated in a way that they're going to understand why you're doing what you're doing. And it doesn't always work out that way, but 
I do love it when I get what I'm doing. So, <laughs> now, have you ever, flops. huh, honey? I said I have had those flops. <laughs> well, I think we all have. And that was kind of where, do you ever kind of second guess your performances or looks that you do? Um, yeah, I do often, honestly. I, I'm the person who will be deciding on a song until the last moment. Um, you know, pageantry, I will second guess everything in my package until the moment I walk on stage. You know, is my hair good enough? Is the jewelry right? Did I make the right choice in the shoe? I second guess every step of the way, and I don't think that that's a bad thing. I think that you should, that's how you better yourself. Absolutely. And I think that just means you're a perfectionist, bitch. Exactly. And I love that. Now, I know that you serve many, many, many high fashion looks. Tell us a little bit of what the audience might be able to see you looking like on stage. Um, I love to show off my curves. Um, I'm a big girl and somebody's got to show off 60 inch hips, you know. Um, I, I love something that's a little bit out there and futuristic, but I also love to make a gown. I love to look and feel gorgeous. You know, fashion plays a big part in what I do. I, I make 90% of what I wear. Um, and I think that that's another thing that might set me apart a little bit is that I'm able, I have a unique gift um, where I am able to think of something and compete it start to finish. You know, I can do the hair, I can do the makeup and I can sew the costume. So that has allowed me to really create some amazing pieces. Um, and my love of fashion has like pushed that even farther. I love that. Now, I, I love that you actually make some of your stuff. I mean, it, it has to be challenging. I especially say this day and age where you do have so many drag um, designers out there that are making so many unique specific drag costumes. Does it ever get hard for you to be creative making your life? Yeah, I go through ruts for sure. There's, you know, I think that whether it be performing or sewing costumes or doing hair or makeup, um, anytime that you're doing something that's as creative and as involved as what we do as drag queens um, and as entertainers is that you should go through some little dips. And that's kind of where I feel like you come out the other side even better than you ever were. Um, that's where you can really kind of push and create and um, find something new within yourself. Okay. I think that's great advice and kind of a great journey there. Now, one thing I really love about you, Monique, is you have some fun kind of crazy looks. One of my favorite was the one you wore at Pride that year. I believe that was pink and it showed off your titties a little, but it had like a giant eyeball on it. Oh yeah, I love that costume. Oh um, my gosh. <laughs> I like to randomly order things on Wish and that was that big eyeball patch was one of them. Um, so I threw that together with a bunch of scraps of lace and like black fabric and a big huge eyeball. I love that costume. It's still oh my, God. my favorite things to wear. Uh, and I love seeing you in that. Now, when you're creating some of these fun kind of just unique looks, where do you get the inspiration for them? I watch a lot of runway shows um, and I love to kind of stare at fashion and music videos and pop culture and um kind of just create things that work really well on my body um but allow me to like have a little bit of fun and be a little bit different like it gives you kind of a one-up they have to have a reason to book you <laughs> <There's> it's a <laughs> true I mean, if you're not bringing the talent they may not book you right <laughs> so speaking of booking you you were the most known around here in Eugene when you were performing here for being one of the amazing Glamazons. Tell me about working with them. Um, the Glamazons are a dream come true. They, um, you know, so I started working with Diva and Caress at Glam and it was the three of us for Glam for many years. Um, I want to say three years um, at John Henry's and it was an amazing time and after I left they created the Glamazons um, and brought in a few different people here and there and then really the Glamazons started with the Wayward Lamb 
And all of that happened while I was on my big long break. Um, and then there's just so happened to be an opening and I took it and ran. I asked Diva if it was okay if I came back and that was how I made my comeback. Um, so they were there for me when I very first moved to Eugene. They were there for me when I wanted to come back to doing drag. They are my family back home. Um, Nikki and Daphne and Diva and Caress are some of the most amazing, talented individuals and they, those girls know how to give a show if it's for five people or 5,000. And um, I appreciate them so much. I think that what I miss most is being in the dressing room and like pushing with them and learning from them. And um, we all inspired each other a lot. And I think that that's huge on a cast situation. And then, I mean, they're still together. Like it's one of the longest running casts that I've seen in a long time. No, and they are, and they're a great group to work with. I get to work with the three Amazons from time to time, and I love it because I think I even celebrated my last birthday with the Glamazons. I got to perform with them. So I think the, the great thing about the Glamazons is they create a classic kind of drag space that people kind of were born with the imagine of it. Now, you know, drag's kind of launched to a whole different level but there's that kind of classic drag that people still crave. And I think that's one reason why Glamazons is actually so popular. I agree. I think that um, in the new culture of drag, if you will, there's a lot of different options and a lot of different types of drag. And I love that even in a small town like Eugene, there was always a showcase for them. Um, there was always a place that they could be or a, a group that they were um, able to work with. And for me, Glamazons was the perfect fit. It, it is what I am. Yes, diva. <laughs> well, speaking of, you all have quite different personalities and different drag styles. You mentioned you guys have fun backstage, but what is the dynamic between all of you? Does it ever get sassy? Well, Diva and Caress are always sassy against each other, let's be real. Um, <laughs> that is their entire 25 year friendship. Um, <laughs> and Nikki's just sassy always. We love Nikki for her sass. Um, but you know what? I've never worked with girls who got along so well, um, who we, you know, we spent many a, a holiday together and we spent many a, a night that was not a Friday spending time together. We, I have such amazing memories going to Bend with them and going to Astoria with them. And we've, we've all had a really amazing time together in Eugene. I, I have nothing bad to say. I love that. And, you know, I, I hope hopefully the bars open up soon and the Glamazons will get back to work because I miss me them. Okay. I, I just want to be back on stage so bad. Bitch, I fucking hear you. I love doing these interviews, but there's nothing more rewarding than doing a lip sync and having a crowd of people watching you and cheering. I agree. So, you know, you again, you worked with the Glamazons. You've done several other amazing things within Eugene. One of the things that stands out that you actually got to do with Glamazons and do your own individual number is you got to perform in an amazing event that we call Divas, Damsels, and Dames, which is a fundraiser for the HIV Alliance. And you got to perform in front of 600 people. Why don't you tell me a little bit about that experience? Um, I love Damsels and Dames. It's one of those shows that you look forward to all year. You get to really create um, something for a larger stage. and it gives us a chance to do something a little bit different. Um, my last, my very last performance before moving to Austin um, was for Damsels, Divas, and Dames, and I got to do kind of my going away number um, at that show, and um, Christopher Dean came and did a full dance around me, and we did, it was a really amazing number that I had really worked my, um, my ass off to, to figure out. It, it was something that I really wanted um, to showcase and be able to do as my final number um, and what a better place to do it and you know the year before I got to do a really fun number called if I can't sell it um, that is one of my favorite numbers to do 
um, and it really works well in a big space like that. And then, um, gosh, I did Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds the year before that. I got to do that show a few times, and it was everything that I could have. Oh my gosh, that's so exciting. I'm actually very happy to say that I was added to the cast this year, so I will be joining the stage in September. Yay! Yes, but I'm really excited because like the year you mentioned this last year, you did a fabulous number where you came out and did this um, ballad to Ashes by Celine Dion. And you have the amazing Christopher Dean dance for you. Now the question I've always wondered in I'm just, now that I have the opportunity, I'm going to fucking ask it because it's my show, is why the fuck wasn't he dressed up like Deadpool, Monique? <laughs> I didn't want it to take away from. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it so much. So tell me a bit about how life has now changed since moving to Texas. Gosh, so everything has changed. Um, we, my husband and I took a big leap of faith about a year ago and decided to move to Austin. And it was, he moved sight and seen. I really had been here like twice. It wasn't like, I mean, we really didn't know what we were getting ourselves into, but um, he took his faith and put it in me. And um, here we are, you know, I, we moved here so that I could do drag and um, try to have a better opportunity and make a name for myself in kind of the Texas pageant scene, um, which I've started. I have ran for two uh, preliminary pageants so far. Since I've lived here, I ran for um, Miss Gulf States Continental Plus and placed first alternate. And then I ran for um, Miss Gay US of A, Miss Austin Gay US of A at large. Um, and place first alternate, because that's the story of my life. Um, and so qualifying me to go on to other, other big contests, one of which will be in Chicago um, Easter weekend. Um, and, you know, Texas pushes you. It's a much different drag scene. Um, and it has really like helped me push myself as an entertainer for sure. And now I'm working at the oldest bar in, in Austin and um, I, get to go out and entertain the masses every night of the week at Oil Can Harry's. Um, I host a show there Thursdays and then Friday nights I, before all of this happened, was hosting a drag race viewing party with, um, with Cynthia Lee Fontaine as my co-host. And, you know, I really put in some amazing opportunities that I had no idea I would ever be able to get. Um, I've worked at every club in town. I was really well received. Um, and it has proven to be the right choice for sure. I love it here. Well, and I sometimes you just need a change in, you know, scenery just to kind of blossom. And I kind of get that, Monique, because I lived in Medford almost my whole life, which is a very small town. It wasn't until I moved to Eugene, I felt like I actually got the opportunity to learn from other queens and kind of blossom myself. And then, you know, I'm even ready now to move to a bigger city, bitch. I want more opportunities. <laughs> right? You got to. I think that removing the fear of, like, what's going to happen was the best thing I've ever done. Like, this move has allowed me to find myself and to move on to a new chapter of my life. And um, my husband and I have really fallen in love. He works at one of the bars here in town um, at, at Oil Can Harry's as well. Um, and, you know, we have like put ourselves right into the community for sure. Oh, I love that, Monique. And since moving to Texas, you've mentioned um, even earlier that your life has changed drastically in several ways, including um, kind of a, a major change that you mentioned since moving to, um, to Texas, which is your transition. Do you mind talking about that a little bit? Yeah, I'm at the very beginning of transitioning. Um, my transness has been a journey. Um, that started very early in life. And when I was 18, 19, I, I took hormones for a while and I did live full time for a hot second there. And um, it was just something that never felt right. Moving here has kind of allowed me to be amongst other trans women who I relate to. And um, I've kind of found a community in that way. And 
my trans journey has really just begun. I um, quarantine really like has helped push it quite a bit, and um, you know I'm in the process of switching it all over and getting on hormones, and um, it's all kind of just starting to snowball, and I couldn't be more excited for what the future holds and um, for this new version of me. I I really that I would actually do it, and here we are. And you know, I didn't even, I personally had no idea that you were going through this journey, which I, I kind of love that you are, because I mean, every time I saw you, I'm like, this bitch is just 100% woman. And then to know that you actually are 100% woman, it's like, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> but tell me a little bit, like, what does it actually mean to you now at this point to be able to embrace that side of yourself and to be able to actually finally live your life as a woman? Um, you know, I, like I said, I'm just at the beginning, so, like, I'm really excited for what the future holds and, and for, um, this new journey to really take off. It's something that I've thought about forever and have really always kind of been on the back burner. I was very happy living, um, where I got to do drag five nights a week and that kind of gave me the outlet and, like, slowly that just has become not really enough. And so moving forward i i just am excited for the journey that it's gonna take me on truthfully like i feel like i get to become a whole new person which is um what it's always been in the back of my mind uh, and speaking of becoming a new person i'm just curious like would you, are you planning on sticking with monique or are you gonna maybe stick uh pick another name just so there's a, a difference between your real life persona and your drag persona I think that right now I'm sticking with Monique. Um, I have like had the moment of like, should it be something else? But like, I mean, some of my close friends call me Momo and like, I, maybe I'll just go by that during the day. I don't, right now I'm just Monique and I, it still is the only name that like feels right rolling off my, my t- so. Okay, well maybe try this one out for size. Just try calling me Cupcake. Yeah. Ah. There's one of my best friends down here is named Cupcake. <laughs> yes. It's amazing. Probably the storyteller of Austin, Texas. And she's this amazing, like, super fashionable mall rat. I don't even know. Like, she's the most amazing thing ever. I hope that she sees this and hears me call her a super fashionable mall rat because she'll die. <laughs> oh, my God, girl. I love it. Now, you mentioned you've been doing drag for so long, and I even think you mentioned a little bit earlier, but how do you feel like drag has actually helped you get in touch with your trans identity at this point? Um, I think that drag was the catalyst to like me realizing that that's what felt right. Um, you know, and it was what allowed me to kind of feel like myself five, six nights a week for the last 18 years. Um, I think that at a certain point it becomes not enough and have to kind of give up and let go and allow your life to continue to move on. Um, there's a certain level of fear that comes along with transitioning and there's a certain level of um, what is going to happen but drag always allowed me to push that aside and go to a place where I could just be. Um, and I could just be who I'm supposed to be every day. And the only real difference is now that I get to do that during the day too. Um, and that I'm allowing myself to live my truth. It's true. And I love that you've actually been able to, I think you've always been a brave person, but I love that you're finally coming to that point in your life where you're not letting anything stop you and you're just gonna say this is who i am this is who i'm gonna be if you don't like it fucking get the fuck out of my way that part i love it now monique you have a long-term husband um, how has this transaction affected your guys's relationship has he been supported through it um yeah so i've been married for five years gosh september will be six years um and Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, he's amazing. And, you know, he's really, like I said earlier, he's put his faith in me to move all the way across country to, like, embark on this journey. And this is something that he's been a part of the whole way through. 
um, and he is just as excited for me and he wants me to, you know, be the happiest, most amazing version of myself. Um, so at this point, like, I mean, ask me in two years, who knows, but at this point we are doing great and he really is the most supportive. I, I couldn't ask for anything else. I love it. You know, I, I've always loved the idea of finding someone who will love you no matter what you look like, what size you are, if you're wearing makeup, or if not. And, you know, I think the fact that you have a partner who loves you for your soul and not exactly, not exactly for what you look like, I think that's truly beautiful. And I think there's a lot of people that really want that. They don't have it. So, bitch, I'm jealous. I'm one of the lucky ones. I count my blessings every day. Well, I love it. Now, do you ever feel that now that you've transitioned, that you're ever treated differently within the drag um, community out there in tax Texas? No, the community out here is extremely inclusive. There are a lot of trans entertainers. Um, it's pretty much the norm out here. Um, the most of at least in the circles that i run in you know and i'm mean, truthfully there trans entertainers are in every facet of our lives and in every part of drag they they exist everywhere um and here there is a large group of trans entertainers um and many of the drag queens here many of the pageant girls in fact probably most of the pageant girls are trans so uh, i really feel like i've kind of found a place where I fit right in. I love that girl. And I love that you're in a community of people who are very similar to who you are. So it feels very inclusive and very like welcoming for you, which I, I you know, I, I always have struggled with feeling welcomed in certain scenes. So the fact that you have found your click, I, I love that, especially moving to a new area. But a little birdie told me, even though you just moved there, you kind of already had a foot in the door because your best friend lived there. Will you tell me about your relationship with the one and only Sable City? Oh gosh, uh, where do I start? Uh, <laughs> I have known each other since before Sable ever did drag. Um, I think I've known Timmy since he was like 17. Um, we met at the escape. Um, nightclub in Portland, the All Ages nightclub, and I left for a little bit and came back and Sable Cities had been born, and um, she's one of my best friends in the whole entire world, and so a, a couple of years ago, she had flown me out um, to Austin to do her hair and makeup for Miska US of A Newcomer, and um, we had a blast, and I came back again to do her makeup for, um, and makeup and hair and be her backstage dresser for Miska US of A Newcomer, um, that following August and that kind of like set it all in motion. She really was a huge part of why we moved here. And yes, I had a foot in the door, but um, she's just, she's amazing. And she pushes you to be as good as you possibly can. And um, she refuses to hand anybody anything. She's probably the person who pushes my drag the most. Um, and we, you know, we worked together for years at the Embers in Portland and we worked together for as long as I can remember in Portland. And um, it's really nice to be back in the same city as her. And God, we, tr we caused some trouble. Uh, <laughs> well, I her and I own a patch together now and we, we get to, you know, kind of experience Texas drag together. And it's kind of what we had always, at the Embers, we would sit around and watch videos of Texas drag being like, one day we're gonna live there. One day we're, that's gonna be us. And, um, here we are. We live in Austin and we're running for pageantry in Texas, which is crazy. I love that. So, you know, it's funny, Monique, because I remember seeing Sable Cities a long time ago on the Divas Dancers in Dame, uh, Dame stage. And I, I, I don't know if I want to admit this on cameras, but I will, but Sable Cities, please don't sue me. Um, I definitely stole the trick that she did that night. And that was where she had a longer dress kind of tucked up and it looked short because it was like held by a belt. And then during her performance, she takes off the belt and the dress drops into a full gown. 
Yes. Bitch, <laughs> I stole that from her, and it's one of my favorite tricks now. <laughs> Well, you also mentioned that you and Sable are both very deep within the pageant world. Now that you also, I mean, it seems like you're focusing so much within that world. Tell me a little bit about that experience. Gosh, pageants are for the type of drag that I love to do um, are kind of the end all be all. It's, it's where we get to go and show off how hard we've been working. Um, it's where we get to connect. It's kind of like going to drag con or going to a car show if you love cars or going to a huge bowling tournament if you're a bowler like pageants are where we get to go and kind of show off what we've been working so hard on in our vision and maybe we'll be the best of the best that night and maybe we will be first alternate like i am um <laughs> but pageants really are where we get to develop and create um family and a community around us and it's where we get to push ourselves and try our hardest for something and it it really does push my drag and a lot of other other uh, of other people's drag to a whole nother level that um wouldn't be there if it wasn't for pageantry i love that what do you actually love most about the pageant drag scene um honestly i love going and like when you go to an out-of-town pageant it's like being at summer camp. My first time ever at Miss Gay US of A Newcomer, there's, you know, I think that that year there was 50 girls um, all competing for Miss Gay US of A Newcomer. Oh and my God. 50 girl. Um, and then their entire teams. So each of them had, you know, somewhere between three and six people with them. So we filled a hotel. I mean, it was, it was like summer camp for five days at, at this hotel in Dallas. So I love being able to come together and see what other people have done and uh, be inspired by what's happening around me. I love it. Now, tell me a little bit what kind of prep you actually have to put into planning to compete to, for one of these pageants. Gosh, it's um, a lot. There's, you know, there could be up to three to six months of pageant or uh, talent rehearsal, figuring out what your lip sync talent is going to be. Um, there's the months of rhinestoning and creating costumes for everything. There's the financial burden. I've never felt like I needed to have a day job more in my life. Um, there's a huge part of it is being able to um, successfully execute such a huge thing, you know, and being able to have the funds to do that is huge. So I, it has made me like more dedicated in my day job as well. <laughs> um, but I feel like that's what pageants are, is it, it gives you discipline and it pushes your career further, it makes you more of a business person and uh, allows you to show your art to more people. I love that. And you know, I love that you kind of describe it as a boot camp that really pushes you to be bigger and better each time. Now, what would you say is the major difference from, let's say, like the club drag scene or the standard drag scene that we see in local, most local areas to the pageant drag scene? I mean, is there a major difference between the two? I think that the pageant scene all of those girls are your local girls. They're all the girls that you see performing on a regular basis. At a pageant to show you the best of what they do. They get to show you how hard they worked for something and they get to show you their best gown and their best performance and their, the best version of themselves. So it's just a heightened level of what we already do. I love it. Now, Monique, Tell me, what does a bitch have to do to fucking stand out within the pageant world? I think you have to be creative and unique um, while still like fitting the mold. Um, I hate that there's a mold for it, but each pageant has their own. Um, but finding how to be uniquely you and pushing the judges to... Um, think that you'll be the best representative for their title. So not only do you have to go out and be unique and give them an amazing package on stage, but you have to have the business mind and the interview skills 
to get yourself through to the next level. Um, you can't win a pageant without interviewing. I get it. Now, Monique, you tend to judge pageants, don't you? I have judged them, yes. Um, I just judged Miss Austin America in February, and that was an awesome experience. Now, my question with that is, you have must seen a lot of special, um, a lot of girls do a lot of amazing things. The one thing I'm kind of curious about is specifically are the talents they do. Because you've been able to see girls really fight for it and do some amazing things, what would you say is the biggest, most standout talent presentation during a pageant that you've been able to witness? Gosh, since I've been here, there's been a couple. Um, I got to see, and I can't even remember who did it. At Miss Gay US Bay Newcomer this last year, in, in August last year, um, there was a girl who was a ballroom dancer who did an incredible ballroom dance, like with professional ballroom dancers um, to Like a River, and I thought that that was incredible. Um, I that same pageant and there was another girl who I don't remember her name but she did a whole like senior citizen home skit where she had like people on stage all with walkers and gray wigs and sh they marched through the whole crowd that was pretty damn incredible um there was a girl who brought her entire she was a director at a local theater and she brought her entire cast and crew from uh, Mary Poppins and did a full Mary Poppins number with the entire cast and crew. Um, oh my god, was, that's uh, so cool! Yeah, these what? girls. So, I'm curious, what's the craziest thing you've actually ever done for a talent for your performances? Gosh, I never go that crazy. Talent is where I always second guess myself. Um, I've done, you know, the typical Mommy Dearest number, I love to do a design skit. That's probably one of my favorites that I've ever done. Um, I did for Miss City of Roses. Um, the last pageant that I did, I did If I Can't Sell It by Ruth Brown, a whole little skit about an antique store that I absolutely love. Um, and then I have something on my sleeve that's coming up for Continental, but we're not gonna discuss that. Oh, okay. We can keep secrets. I'm okay with that, bitch. <laughs> Well, honey, how many pageants have you actually competed in at this point? I think that over the years, it's only been like 10. Um, I ran for a, a bunch when I was younger in Portland, and then I did Le Fait Magnifique in Portland, Le Fait Magnifique International, um, or gosh, what is it? Le Fait Magnifique International Plus. Um, I did a couple of years back, um, which was an amazing experience. I had such a great time doing it. Um, and maybe we'll come back one day. I really liked that pageant. I love the showgirl category. Um, and then here I've done two since I've been in, in Austin. Oh my gosh. And you know, the Love Them Magnifique, um, specifically, you served some amazing ones that I can remember. Of course, you had the over a thousand dollar beaded fucking gown that was fucking stunning. And then you had two looks that you created yourself. One was a black and white themed look, which was a black dress with eyeballs all over it. Tell me about that. Um, that was fun. I, the category was just black and white. So I did, I had always wanted a googly eye gown. So I did a black velvet perfectly fit gown with a slit up to the hip, um, covered in a design pattern that kind of swirled up out of googly eyes. One of my favorite costumes I've ever made. I love it. Well, speaking of favorite costumes you've made, the next one we're about to talk about is my absolute favorite, which is your Vegas showgirl look, which you also created for the pageant. Tell me the fucking work that had to go into looking that fucking amazing! <laughs> um, it was a lot of work. That was one of the hardest things I've ever made. Um, but it really, it's made out of like, just random craft supplies and a bunch of fabric. Um, and then feathers make anything look better. Feathers and rhinestones will make anything look better. Um, but that was a, a pretty, I really wanted that pageant. There's a lot of really big showgirl costumes and I really wanted to have like a true Las Vegas showgirl. Um, very like throwback to 
you know, 1940s, 1950s showgirls in Las Vegas. That was my vision. And I think that I did it. Oh my god, yes, absolutely. I feel like you reminded me severely of like of a rocket. Yes, it was very that. That was exactly kind of the, the world that I wanted to live in. Well, Monique, I mean, again, you've, you've competed in almost 10 pageants. How many of those pageants have you actually won? <laughs> what? Um, what? I have won one. And it was one year I missed I won Miss 2010 at the sale at the Southside Speakeasy in Salem Oregon um which was a preliminary for Miss City of Roses when Adrian Alexander had Miss City of Roses um and that's the only title I've ever won I've never won a crown otherwise um I have always been first alternate always uh, 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 I lost uh, soon I lost super bitch of the universe to Jinx Monsoon I lost <laughs> Miss City of Roses. I lost Latin Lick International. I lost. <laughs> well, I mean, the, oh, but you, you you just mentioned that you actually were um, you lost to Jinx Mon Jinx Monsoon. Yes, I I ran in two pageants against each other. Um, one was Miss Super Bitch of the Universe, which was like a little fun pageant that happened in Oregon, in Portland. Um, and then we ran for Rosebud and Thorn against each other for Rosebud, which is the world's oldest, longest running youth drag title. Mm -hmm. um, and gosh, I was like 18, 19, and she was like 16 or 17. Um, when she won, she beat me by three points. Three. Three oh. points. Well, look at her now. Bitch is a fucking national game known bitch. Yep. That oh. <laughs> well, honey, one thing that you mentioned earlier within the pageant world, it's starting to get a, a little easier and it's starting to open up in multiple facets for multiple kinds of queens. Tell me about the, the diversity that you're starting to see within the pageant world. You know, I think that there was for a really long time, there was like Mr. and Miss and that was it. And you had to be, I mean, even for Mr. and Miss, both titles, you had to be assigned male at birth. Um, and now there's finally, like, pageants are starting to open that up. Miss Gay US of A has, like, seven or eight different titles underneath of the, the US of A franchise. There's one for male entertainers. There's one for uh, assigned female at birth entertainers. There's a newcomer pageant. There's a pageant for girls over 45. There's a pageant for plus size girls. There's a pageant for um, male impersonators. There's a pageant for everybody. Um, there's now there's National Monster Extreme, which is starting this year, which oh. is for the next like crazy monster of drag. Um, there's Comedy Queen, Miss Comedy Queen is starting this year, or is, is a pageant that's been going on. We're trying to bring it to Austin this year. Um, there's a Bearded Queen pageant, National Bearded Queen, or National Bearded, uh, oh gosh. National Bearded Queen, I think is what the title is. I'm probably wrong. Um, but there is a title for everyone now, which I just, I think is amazing. I do too. I love, because to me, I have always been attracted to the pageant world, the glitz and glam and all of that, the rhinestones and the beads. But I, not being your traditional drag queen, sometimes get intimidated by it. So to hear that there are certain, you know, pageants that, those are actual queens that are very similar to like who I am. Like I would be very interested in competing in the comedy um, competition because bitch, I'm like, you know, a fucking clown bitch. I'm Melina Bitchcock. Uh, yes, you should. You totally should. Well, I'll tell you a secret, Monique. That's not public news yet, but um, uh, well, some people know. Um, I'm actually hoping that. I auditioned for a little reality show that they call Camp Wanna Kiki. So we're still picking a cast. They haven't picked anyone yet, but pray for me, bitch. Pray for me. Um, the girl Wanna Kiki lives here in Austin and she's amazing. Oh, oh my God. I'm jealous. Now, speaking of these platforms that give drag queens opportunities to be seen and to kind of get taken seriously on national television, would you ever go on RuPaul's Drag Race? Um, as a trans entertainer, um, as somebody who's 
starting my transition. It's not really something that is an option for me at this point. Mm -hmm. um, right. I don't think that, that venue of television is like right for me. I would fail as soon as there was a singing challenge or a dancing challenge or something like that. Um, I would love to do reality TV, but I would want it to be like more of like a follow me around before a pageant kind of thing. So you mean like documentary style? I would love to be in a documentary. Come well, film me. A, a little birdie told me that you and your homegirl Miss Sable Cities actually in the long run want to come up with your own pageant drag documentary. Is that correct? Yeah, we want to like put together a RV that will take us to the pageants and like you can watch us get ready for everything. Um, and we would like to do like something where it's like the months that are leading up to the pageant instead of just the pageant. Like we want it to really be um, the real behind the scenes. Whereas like a lot of the pageant movies that have come out like are kind of about the actual pageant itself. Like we want to show you everything that happens around the pageant. Especially the shady shit. That's what I want to see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not shady. I don't know what you mean. Well, love bug, we're almost done with this interview. I only have a couple of more questions. One of the next things I feel like we need to know is what's something important for people to know about Monique LaFay that they don't already? Gosh, I think that looks can be deceiving. I may be painted up like this and I may be really intimidating, but I'm like the nicest girl in the room. And I just want everybody to like love what I'm doing and to really appreciate the art that I put out there and how hard I work for it. And um, if there's one thing that I can like leave people with, it would be to know that I like really just do this because it's what I love and I hope that you love what I love. I love that Monique. And I, I, I think that you know, we, we're sometimes painted up with these fierce, rusted bitch faces, but underneath it all, we're all human. And, you know, speci specifically you, I mean, uh, I remember when I first moved to Eugene, and I was scared of all you fucking bitches because it was a big drag scene. And uh, you were one of the first girls to, you know, even though I was a little intimidated by you, you were very welcoming to me. You actually let me be part of your drag battle show that you were producing at the time. And one of my greatest memories is when I was actually running for Empress at Pride and I was performing on stage. You came up there in full drag with your dollar bill and tipped me. And I'm like, Monique LaFay just tipped me. <laughs> oh my gosh. But I love it. So what are we to expect next from the one and only Monique LaFay? Gosh, um, I'm gonna, I'm really trying hard to like start a YouTube channel. I, that's my next like big endeavor for this quarantine and to like give me an, more of an outlet. As soon as we're able to get back into the bars, like I'm ready to go full steam ahead. I okay. really to get back out there and then start working my ass off for these pageants. I have two pageants this next year. Um, and I just want to really show you everything that I can be um, at the same time as becoming this whole new person that I am so excited to take the journey for. Oh, baby, I'm so excited for your journey that you're finding out there in Texas. Um, so before I move into our game, we have two more questions. The them is probably one of the most important questions that you'll ever be asked within your entire drag career. And right. what do you think of Melina Bitchcock? Oh, I think she's a bitch. Oh, good. Yeah, I think you're doing it. <laughs> Well, thank you. You know, I really enjoyed getting to know you through this interview, though. What did you think about your experience on Bitch Talk with Bitchcock? I have had so much fun. I love that I'm getting to reconnect with Eugene and with that part of the community. And maybe you'll get to connect a little bit with the new community that I'm part of out here. Um, and it has been so much fun. I love spilling the tea. You know, I appreciate you coming on the show. I was almost intimidated to ask you to come on the show because, you know, you are living out in Texas now. You have a whole new life. But 
you're such a fierce performer and I felt like your story was valid and that people really needed to hear what you go through because what you have to offer the queer and drag community is so much. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I love what we do for sure. This is, I believe in the art of drag. Absolutely. Well, all you boys and girls and all those in between, if you have been enjoying this fabulous episode of Bitch Talk with Bitchcock with the one and only Monique Le Fay, I want you to take a peek within to the description where you can find her PayPal, her Vimo, and Cash App information. And if you want to show a little extra appreciation during these hard times, please make sure to give her a little extra something, including the tip. And if you would like, and you really enjoy me producing these episodes, please feel free to also tip me. You can find my information in there also. Um, I also kind of want to announce that Bitch Talk with Bitchcock this Monday will have episode 27 on the 18th of May as I interview my first ever bearded queen, I get the one and only Eugene drag favorite, Manhattan Brown. <gasps> oh my goodness. I'm so excited to get this queen on the talk show to talk about all the tea of being a bearded queen and kind of about her drag style because this bitch is a witchy girl. Yes. So Monique, before I let you go and we say our goodbyes to everyone, would you like to play a little game with me? I'm ready. Good girl. Well, I figured let's get you lubed up first. If do you have any alcohol over there? Oh yes, girl. Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, this little game we like to call truth or drink. And how it will work is I'm going to ask you a series of shady questions. And you can either answer truthfully or take a drink. Okay, girl, are you ready for round one? For round one, who is your favorite Glamazon? I can actually, I, I'm okay with answering that. I'm okay with answering that. Caress, she's my best friend in Eugene. Um, and I don't think that any of the girls would be mad about me saying that. Caress is maybe, she's one of my favorite people. So the fact that she's part of Glamazon, she gets that award. Oh, and I do love Caress. She's one of the nicest people you'll ever meet within the drag scene and the most real. I mean, one of the, I mean, one of the moments I love to actually have at a drag show is with someone like Caress, where it's like you just get done performing for hours and you're like, you know what, let's go out back out to the alley and smoke a fucking blunt. And you're like, you're my kind of queen girl. Morgan, I miss being able to go to the alley and smoke a blunt. <laughs> we'll have to do a virtual smoke session soon, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, for round two. Why don't you tell me about your worst sexual experiment or experience? I love the, can it be in my worst sexual experiment? Because that's hilarious. Uh, um, sure, bitch. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my worst sexual experience. Oh, God. Put me on the spot. Um, the worst ever was probably... I was like 18 years old and it was the escape nightclub. I had just gotten out of drag. I didn't have no boy underwear and I was trying to pick up the straight boys that were at the club. You know how it is. You go out, you try to pick up all the boys. You go out right. trying to act like you trade to, but you not, you're drag queen. And I only had girl panties and I had girl panties on and got in the car and had girl panties on. So make sure you take the panties off and just free ball if you're trying to pick up the trade. Uh-huh. Oh, God, girl, I miss those days where we went out to the bar dressed up looking like beautiful women and been like, hi. And those straight boys, the moment they find out you have a little extra something downstairs, uh, sometimes, I don't want to say all the time, um, they're into it. They're really into it. Have you ever had titties on your back? That's what I like to ask. Oh, 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 my God, I'm going to so steal that pickup line. <laughs> okay, 
For round three, Miss Monique, tell us about your worst performance flop. And a performance flop is where like your wig falls off, your titty falls out, or you fell on your face. Um, okay, I'll give you the most recent one because I have them all the time. Let's be real. I have them all the time. I was performing hit 'em up style at Sellers Underground here in Austin. And I like went down, I thought it was gonna be real cute. I like in these tall boots and I dip down to the ground, let my booty kind of hit the ground and I'm supposed to pop back up, but I just fell right backwards. So then I try to get up and as I'm trying to get up, my titties fall out onto the ground. My silicone titties fall out on the ground and then I fall like trying to get up. Baby, I left that stage so fast. I always do to finish the number. I just ran. My titties had fallen out. I had fallen three times. <laughs> oh my God, that's some real tea, especially that's a, a recent story, bitch. That was like two weeks before quarantine ended. <laughs> ah! <laughs> okay. For round four, oh God, this is the, probably the question that's going to get me in trouble. What's the shadiest thing you've ever done in drag? In drag or involving drag? I will, uh, whatever's going to give me the most peaceful answer. <laughs> uh, the shadiest thing I've ever done. Um, I'll be nice. So the last pageant that I was dressing at, there was a girl that had some, some, some tape showing at the top of her gown. And I could have, I had the time and I could have been nice and I could have, you know, gone and trimmed it off for her. But she was going on right before my contestant and I just let her. Uh, uh, I mean, girl. I, it's pageants. I'm my contestant was trying to be the best. Hey, I mean, honestly, when you're competing against a bitch, don't expect me to be your sister. I mean, bitch, I'll throw pearls on the stage to win. Okay. As soon as crowning is over, we can be friends. I'll buy you a shot. But I'm not going to touch that duct tape. Oh my gosh, yes. So for your last question of truth or drink, I think this is the one that's going to get you in trouble with your drag family. Who do you think is your favorite drag child? I'm going to drink. Oh, okay. Take a shot, girl. Yeah, so I'm pouring a little bit more alcohol in here. Cheers, baby. I don't Cheers. Think that's hard. All of my kids in Eugene are so sweet and so amazing. I can't pick a favorite. Um, I could if I really had to, but since I get to drink instead, I'm gonna. Oh my! Well, I will say that you do have some amazing drag children. If you are out in the Eugene area, please look out for Uranus the Fool and Bonnie Rose. They are both fabulous, fabulous drag performers, and they bring you such uniqueness to the stage so um if you want bonnie rose has also been interviewed on bitch talk with bitchcock and hopefully someday uranus the fool will return my messages about coming on the show also bitch but okay. huh i was yelling at my daughter hey uranus call her back yes rat bitch i want to get you on the show so we have one more game. This one is actually a little bit of a surprise. I didn't tell you we were going to do this, but it's one of Bitch Talk with Bitchcock's favorite. And we like to call this Mary Kai Kai or Cancel. And what's going to happen is I'm going to name three names to you. And you're going to tell me who you'd marry, who you'd Kai Kai, and who you'd cancel their fucking shows completely. Oh, I'm scared. You should be, bitch. <laughs> well, perfect. For round one, we have Eugene favorites and glamazons, Daphne Bertha Storm for Rasan Slaughter and Diva Simone Slaughter. Marry Kai Kai or cancel? Yes. I'd marry Caress because I know that I could do it. <laughs> I know that we would get along just fine. I'd Kai Kai with Diva, because he's kind of, um, Anthony, I'll take it. I love a handsome man. Um, and Daphne has been saying that she wanted to be done for a long, I'll cancel her myself. Oh my, I mean, I don't know if I should admit this on the show, especially with Daphne coming on within the near future. But 
if I had to pick, I'd probably Kai Kai Daphne because she's a fucking gorgeous older man. She is handsome. Let's be real. I just she have a thing. I think that Anthony Barber is so handsome. Have you seen him with a beard lately? Oh my gosh. Yes, that's what I mean. <laughs> okay. Well, for round two, I really want to get you in trouble. So I have the one and only Bonnie Rose, the incomparable Uranus the Fool, and of course, Doc Ranger, all three of your drag children. Oh gosh. I would marry Bonnie because I think that we would get along real well in the house department. Like, I feel like we could live together very well. I would Kai Kai with Uranus because we're both too pretty and that would make a really great OnlyFans episode. And I would cancel Doc because Doc doesn't do drag that often anymore anyways. Oh boy, cancel the canceled person. That's, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well this last one comes with some of your old school sisters, and this is our last round before we say our goodbyes to everyone. We have your best friend and drag sister, Sable Cities, the Portland misfit, Vivica Valentine, and the one and only, Adrian Alexander. Um, I'd marry Adrienne Alexander because I already know that I can spend multiple hours in a car with her. I moved her from Portland to Palm Springs and I drove the U-Haul. And so we've kind of moved in together once. Um, I would Kai Kai with Sable Cities because, let's be real, I really want Timothy Byers to have a um, full mullet. And then I would really Kai Kai with Timoth Timothy Byers. Um, uh -huh. And I would cancel Vivica because she beat me at Lip In. <gasps> oh, that's the real tea right there. <laughs> well, I love it. Well, honey, guess what? You survived the entire interview of Bitch Talk with Bitchcock. I did it. You did it, queen. Guess what? You actually won because, bitch, you fucking tore this interview up. Oh, thank you. I had so much fun. Um, and I'm so excited to like get to know you a little bit better and let you get to know me a little bit better. Well, I'm happy that we got that opportunity also because, bitch, I've been looking up to you for years and it was very hard for me not to fangirl over here. I'm just like, it's Monique LeFay, it's Monique LeFay, hold your shit together, hold your shit together. <laughs> bitch, I'm so happy you're here. And thank you again for gracing us with your wonderful presence because you've been able to share kind of a new side of you that I don't think a lot of people either really got to know or really got the opportunity to know. So I kind of love that you came in here and spilled a lot of that tea. Well, I'm really happy our next episode of Bitch Talk with Bitchcock is coming up this Monday, boys and girls and all those in between, as we have the bearded queen herself, Manhattan Brown. Again, we want to give a round of applause for the one and only Monique LeFay. Thank you for having me. Of course, love. Well, babe, again, all you beautiful people, if you've enjoyed this episode, make sure to tip Monique LeFay. She's working really hard this day and age to look so fucking amazing out there. Uh, if you're enjoying Bitch Talk with Bitchcock, please make sure to share, like, and tip. In the meantime, all of you stay safe. Have a fantastic weekend, and we love you all. Mwah. Bye, y'all. Yeah, please. Yeah.